Sell me this pen. This iconic line is well known among sales professionals everywhere, but what's the answer? Welcome to the Generation Hustle Podcast, a show that explores the world of business, entrepreneurship, and culture all centered around the millennial. I'm your co-host Sherison alongside my good friend Amin, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Josh Solomon, Director of Enterprise Sales at Ada Incorporated. Ada is an AI-powered platform that enables businesses to drive an incredible customer experience through scalable automation. Josh has built his entire career in sales, a field so important that he suggests a good sales professional is able to transfer their sales skills into life skills. So we asked Josh about his journey through sales and dive into his philosophy around skills that are transferable to life. He walks us through the important steps that sales professionals should understand from nurturing a lead all the way to securing a customer. We also dive into how Ada's platform helps businesses and dispel the negative connotation around the word chatbot. So whether you want to become a better salesperson or want to learn must-have skills for your own personal development, this episode is definitely for you. So sit back and listen to Josh sell us that pen. Let's just get right into this. Um, Obviously, so... so, um or let's just call you Josh for the episode. <laughs> uh, I've known you for three years now, uh, and we've worked together for two, right? So, um, and throughout that whole period of time, I've always been kind of noticing that you're a consistent individual that wants to constantly learn new things and wants to better yourself. So, uh, you know, let's just start it off right away in terms of describing what your motivations are around you know, how you kind of pave the way for your creative thinking and how you kind of tackle your challenges on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, for sure. So I think that's right. And, and I mean, maybe the one thing that I would start with saying is like, maybe just to shed a little light on this is that over the last period of time, I've spent a, a, a good chunk of my, you know, my mental focus on how to improve sort of my mind and body and, and go forward in that direction. But it definitely wasn't always that way. And I think, you know, something that, you know, I personally don't share very often is that like growing up, you know, I struggled a lot with my weight. I struggled a lot with self-esteem issues. And I think probably like the people around me, at, you know, in my childhood, at least, uh, probably would have not seen that side of me emerging. I don't think my name people would have made that bet. Right. And, and this really started for me a long time ago. Like I would say like maybe seven, eight years ago. And I was really down about something. And like, as I think back on it now, like it felt like a lot then, and now it, it, it was nothing. And uh, I, there's a there's a moment that like really sticks out in my head for where this started. As with a friend, I was really really upset that day, and we decided to go to a bookstore. And at that day, like that point in time in my life, I don't think I was reading a lot really, if at all. And we were walking to this bookstore, and there was like this bright orange book that sort of like called to me. And mm-hmm. I, I picked it up. I started reading in the store. I ended up buying it. And, and I went home and I, I remember just crushing it. Like I went through it really quickly. And it was the first time in my life that I realized, like, actually, no, this is up here and not out there. Yeah. And that was the first sort of signal to me that like, actually, hey, listen, man, like you have it in your head. It's all in your head first. And, and then we go forward from there. And then I, I think moving through that, it, it's just been sort of like what I would call like a slow build, right? Like you guys are both finance guys. And yeah. um, I think people think progress is always linear, but but it's not, right? Like if we look at like a stock chart, like it's always up and down, right? And I, I look at the, the idea of personal development to be very similar. You sort of build up and then you sort of normalize and you build up, then you normalize and you build up again, right? And so my focus has, has really been on, you know, how do I get, how do I sort of shorten the time at the low? and continue push to those new highs. And, and so I think that your comments around like, how do you deploy this on like a daily basis? Mm-hmm. I think it starts with like being able to put this like fundamental baseline or like a framework from where you operate, right? So like, especially like we're gonna get into the sales thing and you know, sales is problem solving, right? So like every time a problem shows up, you have two choices. You can look at it and go like, or you can go like, oh, great, what's the opportunity inside of this, right? And that's true in life across like just about everything, right? So yeah. I think this this is what's taught me a lot on and by no means perfect is, you know, how do you start to look at hard things and see see the path forward? Yeah. How do you start to com- uh, compartmentalize, you know, the things inside of these hard things and build paths through each one of those? And, you know, like, how do you respond when you get punched in the gut, right? Like, yeah. and hopefully take a more positive light to that. No, that's awesome. I think uh, the way you kind of approach it um, and realizing, you know, uh, a lot of what we do 
uh, nowadays is the mental game around it. Um, and obviously our environment impacts us in different ways. And I'm happy to see you're obviously you've made a lot of progress through uh, your life now. Um, and so one of the things that always comes up to me, I know we are having, um, uh, man, I even forgot the name. What was, the, what was the thing that we do once a month on Thursdays? Um, <laughs> the BioConnect? The, the leadership, the, the leadership Le stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of, um, I remember you were talking about that book. I think it's Extreme Ownership. Yeah. Uh, is that the thing that comes to mind? So um, what is uh, what about books has really helped you in terms of, you know, um, developing that, right? So uh, it seems like you've uh, been more accustomed to reading books. And you said before and that it's not something that you used to, but, uh, you know, it's changed kind of the trajectory of what you uh, become or as a person. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, yeah, that was sort of like the pivotal moment. And then from there, like I said, a build and, you know, a lot, a lot of reading since that time. And it's something that I've, you know, really focused on as a priority. Um, and there's a couple of books that I think stick out, but I think like maybe I'll just say how I, how I think about them. I've always focused on sort of like two types of books in the space. And, and one has been like business leadership books mm -hmm. and I'll explain why. And then the other has been like a self-awareness and emotional intelligence books. And the reason for me is that these two are a Venn diagram. Right. And it, it starts back to that idea of like, how do you build this framework for how you think and starting to have what I think I call it the leadership mindset or the leadership mind. Most people probably refer to it as like the growth mindset, but creating this like this, this sort of this substance of like I act first. Right. And so a couple of books that, that stick out to me. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, OK, cool. Uh, so there's a book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. That's the orange book that was sitting on the shelf. And, you know, that's like your classic self-help. Right. Book. And, and I'm always I'm always really cautious with the word self-help because there's like tons of like foo-foo nonsense out there. Right. That like you got to sort of delineate between de development and like nonsense. Right. Um, two others that I that I've gone back to time and time again. There's one in the business sphere. It's called uh, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. And an amazing book uh, about sort of the the idea of like how to act always as a leader and in both your personal life and your professional life. Um, and the other is Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss, which mm -hmm. in my opinion is like maybe one of the most valuable books ever written. Like if you just looked at the ROI on the book and, and the reason is like you put $30 into the book and you, you don't have to pay the dummy tax that everyone else has paid to learn what they do really, really well. Right. You look at like the top 1% of, you know, someone in some sphere of some profession and they've already paid all the dummy tax for all the hard learning and, and that's your shortcut path. So those two are really, really important to me. The other thing that I just comment on though, is like readings one, one channel, but um, it's a slow channel, right? It's really hard. So as we think about like how to build rapid progress, it's really slow, right? It, you only get so much time and experience. And so you mentioned like the idea of the extreme ownership presentation or like right. extreme, extreme ownership. So that's another vehicle that I've used a lot to help me really bake these concepts into my head. And so once I find something that I think is interesting or like really meaningful to me, the first thing that I want to do is go test that on someone else. So like, how do I get in front of a group of people and explain this? How do I teach it? And like, I really have doubled down on this power of, of teaching and for a couple of reasons, right? Like one, it really tests you to understand like, do I understand this well enough that I can regurgitate it to someone else. The second is, can I do that in a way that's simple enough to test my communication skills that I can actually see, yeah, Almond got it or, yeah. or, or no, he didn't. Right. And until you can do that, it's not really baked in your head. And, and then I think the third channel, right. Is so like I made a comment about sort of like the, the like diet and weight loss and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But like, if you want to change your body, you change what you eat. If you want to change your mind, you need to change what you consume. And, you know, like I changed my mental diet. So, and that's another faster channel, right? Because we spend our day on Instagram and you can either take, you know, stupid memes in, or you can find, you know, meaningful content that continues to reinforce that for you. So right. I've always sort of, sort of split it up that way. Yeah. I think we need to put that in like a, a little quote and frame that up. I love that. It's a mental diet. It's totally different kind of thinking, but I absolutely love that. And you're, to your point where Tim Ferriss, I actually have that book in my um, uh, checkout box. Like I was just reading a few things. I'm going to buy it for sure now. So it's um, I, yeah, it's a great book. And I think uh, just looking at some of the concepts high level, um, I think 
it's a great way to kind of consume. But uh, to your point of also being able to consume at a um, digestive pace, I would say, um, I've been consuming a lot more of like the short feature content on YouTube yeah. that has been, you know, really been helpful. And I think, uh, Sherston, maybe you can relate to us um, through this experience of podcasting. We've kind of learned how to kind of regurgitate questions and build questions up and interview um, like coming from our first first episode to like episode 20 plus, I think there's been a vast improvement and that's just been a factor of research and uh, practice and totally. how we communicate. Totally. And I, I mean, like you, you, you have a mental muscle, right? Like the brain yeah. mental muscle, right? So like you, you don't, um, you don't make progress with inaction, right? Yeah. You make progress by repeating, right? And then reflecting on, did that work? Did it not? How do I improve it? And, and that's how you go forward. Yeah. Yeah. And so that brings us to our next point is, is there actually, in your opinion, a, a point in which you can actually go overboard with self-improvement? Um, I feel like, you know, um, there is some certain capacity that an individual can actually handle, but I, I feel like uh, just this hustle culture also yeah. has an impact on us from a social media perspective saying, keep go, go, go. Um, but there is a capacity, I feel. There yeah, definitely. And, and that's, that's a really good point. I think, well, like, let me maybe answer that in two ways. Is that like, I think the first one of going overboard is like, like, like everything too much of anything is bad. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing that I've noticed a lot is that what we, what you find with people who are sort of like perpetual learners is that it becomes a crutch, right? It's like, I can't take the action because I'm still learning. So I always get back on my crutch and then I'm like, well, I got to learn more until it's perfect. And then I'll take that step. But what we actually end up is we're just making excuses for ourselves, like to not do something or, or to not actually drive that forward. Right. So I think that that's like one of the big red flags for me is like, you, you have to be able to, again, like go back and break the problem down. And I think for some people, right, again, it's like, I start to pull the covers back on this thing and I'm like, whoa, there's a lot here. There's, there's a lot, <laughs> you know, how do you start to, you know, how do you not get overwhelmed by that? Right. And then again, like to your point on like, um, thinking about, you know, what you see on Instagram of like, you know, work for 18 hours a day and, you know, yeah. and better with dying and whatever, you know, it, it, it's, it's challenging for a vulnerable mind, right. Especially if you're in that state where you're doing a lot of self-reflection and you're looking like, what are my, what are my peers doing? Or what are these figures doing? And am I doing the wrong thing? So I think you have to be super guarded with that. And I, I, I do think that that speaks like volumes to the idea of like, you know, as sort of like, like I talked about sort of like the, the emotional intelligence or emotional awareness bucket, like getting to a point where you're comfortable enough that you're not in comparison mode. You know, the, this work is not being done because like you need to get more followers. The work is getting done because you want to get better as a human being, right? And I, 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 once you get out of the comparison mode, I think that becomes a little bit easier to manage. For sure. Yeah. And and I can could connect that to our podcast journey, like I'm going to mention, just because I think in our early stages, when we're trying to um, kind of work up our Instagram page, a lot of the focus on around my page would be engagement in terms of how many follow- followers I'm getting or how many likes I'm getting because of that. And then after a while, it's like you, you're just running in circles. But then when you start focusing on the actual value you're giving in the content, whether the the image or the, the video or the caption, it's like when you focus on that, you you don't even pay attention to the engagement and it just comes naturally totally you got to break the chain right like yeah th- like this is you know this is a, in a whole different lens but like the the thing that i think about a lot is like 10 years ago the problem we had as like a, as a society and business was we didn't have enough data to make the decision and you know, today we have too much data and every mm-hmm. being has too much data so it's too hard to understand like is this valuable like, and if my only vanity metric is a like or a comment or an engagement score, then how do I actually know I'm adding value, right? And so like, you have to be able to break away from that chain a little bit. And, you know, the hardest thing, in my opinion, today on to do as a, as a person on the internet is sift through to what is real, what, right. is, through, yeah. what, is, your, what is the truth, right? And, and that's, you know, I think, a hard part for you guys. Yeah, I think it's always going to be a challenge with, I think, more and more data that's going to be out there. And yeah, it's a like, lot of our people going away. Yeah, a lot of our platforms, we don't even know how to consume or actually tangibly use that data now uh, as well. So that's another issue that will obviously come about. Um, and uh, so that brings us to a perfect segue. We kind of talked about how you kind of built out um, who Josh is today um, from a holistic perspective. But let's also talk about your sales career as a whole. Um, 
And currently you're at, you're the director of enterprise sales at a company called Ada. Is Ada. that how we, Ada, Ada, okay. Um, that's how you pronounce it. Um, and so uh, let's just break down what about sales itself um, appealed for you, appealed to you and why it's something that you've stayed in uh, for so long. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, sales has been in my life for a really long time. And so like, um, I'll maybe just give you like a sense, like there's, um, maybe when I was 16, I was like working all the time in kitchens. I'd been working from like kitchen to kitchen to kitchen and I was washing dishes and that that is not fun work. And I had my first shift at this like new Italian place one night. And, um, I remember it being like a Saturday. It was late. It was like maybe at 1am or something. I really wanted to go home. I remember this dude brings over like this massive pot of like garlic sauce or something. And I was like sitting there cleaning it. And all I could think was like, I'm never doing this again. Like there's no fucking way I'm doing this again. I'm not yeah. doing that. And, um, you know, so I had one week until the next shift. So I had to figure out like, how do I not have to do that again? Right. And, you know, whatever happened, I ended up getting a, a sales role at Future Shop in like a retail environment selling. Right. Things. And truthfully, that taught me, like, as I still think back, like that environment taught me so much about how to sell. And I've always referred to it as like, you got so many at bats, right? Like you have one customer, one customer, one customer. So you, I got a lot of early opportunity to like be able to sort of like train again, that mental muscle. And uh, I think fast forward to today, the thing that's kept me in sales is it's, in my opinion, it's one of the only uh, professions, especially in technology, that's like highly accountable. It's black and white. You either did it yeah. or didn't. And, mm-hmm. um, especially in smaller companies and startups, uh, it, it's it's so rewarding to me to be able to track my impact. You know, right. to, be able to see like if I do A, B, and C, then, you know, X, Y, Z come out, right? And that's internally and externally, right? You're able to see like, look at the change that taking on this big project created for our internal organization. Yeah. Right? We're in a whole different direction now. Look at the change that I actually made on this customer's business. This is a Fortune 500 company and they've completely changed the way they do something, you know, because of our advice. So I've always felt it to be really rewarding. It's always been like something for me that I, I've loved being able to see like, you know, I did that and um, which, is, which has been fantastic. And I think the other thing that is, you know, really underserved in, in sales and a lot of people don't think about it is it, it's actually a really good arena to build leadership skills. Right. And, and the reason I say that is, in my opinion, sales, especially at a high level of sales, right? Like we can talk about all sort of like the scale of, of sales roles, but at a high level of sales, um, you know, for senior salespeople, it's purely influential leadership, right? No one has to follow you, right? It's no one works for you. No one has to do what you say, but in order to be successful, you have to get people to follow you. You know, people have to, when the at the crossroad go, okay, it doesn't matter what happens. I'm following Josh because he's taking us to the right place with this customer for our company, whatever. So right. It's, um, I think in a, in a sort of roundabout way, it's a really great place to actually learn uh, a true style of leadership. That's not command and control. Right. And so how often, Mike, are you actually doing the day-to-day sales now versus leadership? That's maybe none, uh, today. none today. So today everything is through others. And I mean, that's a whole other topic as you start yeah. to sort of the transition, um, you know, this, the transition from, uh, you know, individual contributor to manager, there's definitely a dark side, you know, there's like sort of an industry saying of like good salespeople aren't always good managers. Right. You know, the, the hard part is you got to retrain your mind, right? Like no longer can I get it done through me. I have to get it done through everybody else. And, and for me, it, it took me two cracks at this. You know, the, the first time I went into a management role, it was like more like a player coach role. I, I still mm. carrying a quota, but I had some people reporting to me. And I found it very hard to prioritize which one and yeah. where to focus the time. And then because of that, like your lazy brain goes to the one you know how to do, right? Right. So the, the management side suffered. And I was pretty early in my career. And then and the second time, I think I was farther along in this development journey and, and much more self-aware about what, how I needed to be and what, how I had to change what my motivations were in, in order to find that success. Right. No, I think I totally agree with you, Andy. One of the things I'm going to actually kind of peel back here is you've been in sales, you're obviously on the field and on the ground. So uh, you've mentioned the impact you can have uh, with, say, a large uh, customer coming in. And for a fact, I know that you've done that in the past. Uh, 
I'm not going to name names because it's not supposed to be exposed, but uh, we'll just keep it. We'll just say it's a large company. Um, so uh, in terms of like that, obviously there's B2B, B2C, but let's just focus on B2B because that's primarily um, where your field of experience has been sure. thus far. Um, so let's let's look at actually kind of nurturing the lead and what your approach is in terms of some of the steps that you should take as a sales professional to understand and then execute on the sale. Okay. Yeah. So, well, okay. So I think like you got to take maybe I'll take one step back from that first. Okay. And like, I think the first, the first thing you have to like, I think for, especially like sales is a very broad spectrum. Right. And then even in B2B sales, like we, we've got all sorts of like levels of seniority type of sale, whatever. So the, the, the first place that I would start in this is understanding like what type of sale is this? How transactional is it versus how like solution oriented or, or consultative is it? Right. Because these are going to drive two very different sales processes. So understanding, you know, how you should behave and, you know, what that time period looks like and, you know, what the right milestones are, um, you know, is very, very different. Um, I think the biggest thing in that, like, if my, my advice to sellers would be to do a better job and spend more time focusing on where is that prospect in their buyer journey. And, you know, often I think what you see is like sort of it's like this one size fits all approach. Right. So regardless of, you know, uh, of what that company is doing, we treat it the same way. We go, we, we do a pitch, we do a demo, we do a sale, we put a proposal in front of them. But meanwhile, in, meanwhile, the, the prospect, you know, they might have only realized they had this problem two months ago and yeah. really they're, in, they're in education mode. So how you would treat someone who's in education mode versus someone who's looking to make a decision is really different. So starting and taking like the salesperson hat off and putting the customer hat on is extremely important. Being able to recognize who first, who is it that I'm selling to? Like, what's that persona? Am I selling to HR? Am I selling to marketing? Am I selling to IT? Whatever. You know, what do they care about and where are they in their journey, right? How long and how far along are they into that, into that, that buying journey? And you know, this is something that I think is really hard in modern B2B sales. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, probably one of the most enlightening experiences that I, that I had that helped me as a set seller was not selling. It was actually buying. It, it was right. out and it was more actually living in a product lens and evaluating technology for a product that we were building. Right. And going out and talking to five vendors and then going through five discovery calls and then going through five demos and dealing with five different sales personalities. And you know, that's it gets really trying. It's really hard. And then right. you look at like the other side of this as a buyer, there's a, a list of stakeholders in your company who need to get on the same page. You need to make a case. You need to build your business case. You, you have someone who's not just not a supporter of the project at all. So the internal complexity is really hard. And, and I'm talking from a lens of a hundred person company, not right. going into a 30,000 person company or a hundred thousand person company. So you can imagine how complicated it gets there. Right. And, and I think this is the area where B2B sales organizations, uh, sales and marketing have to start to behave a little bit different. Uh, you have to realize that like no longer, um, you know, Gartner has great content on this, but yeah. um, like no longer uh, is sort of like the, is it the marketing funnel than the sales funnel? Your reps are just one touch point, but your, your customers are learning about you, you know, all across digital and physical interactions. And so right. that, that's really changing and you need to be aware of it. Right. And I think uh, just from my experience, a company that does really well at that, um, and this is coming from a finance lens, so it's kind of biased. Um, is uh, NetSuite, I feel. Yeah. Um, those guys have done a really good job um, in terms of, you know, uh, having the, the digestible content that as finance professionals, we need to know. Um, and they make it really, really easy to understand. And uh, obviously at BioConnect, we went through a whole NetSuite transition and the entire sales process was like the most seamless thing I've ever went to personally. Yeah. And uh, to your point, it's just uh, having, you know, uh, material out there and, and not just like one discovery call is going to kind of close the deal. It's more than that. Now it's, just, it takes a lot more because there's so many other solutions out there in the market um, that you're competing against as well. Yeah. Right. And like, take your, take your example, right? Like um, one, if I'm, if I'm a salesperson on NetSuite, I, I need to recognize I'm selling into finance, right? I need to understand what does, what does finance care about? I need to understand where is BioConnect and how likely are they, like, are they just trying to figure this out or are they like really in deep need, right? And then from a marketing perspective, we talked about the content, 
you know, how it, that content has to be valuable. The content just can't be a bunch of features and functions. It has to be insightful, right? It has to, it has to teach me something about it because I'm spending all day on the internet and I can get the research anyways. So if I show up to the meeting and the salesperson can't tell me something I didn't already read on your website, then how valuable is that exchange and how much do I want to call that person back? Yeah. Yeah. And so that kind of uh, leads to me the idea of when do you actually cut off a prospective lead? I, I think, <laughs> I think a lot of us get into a loophole of like, you know, uh, we've, you know, the fish has caught the line on the hook, but like there has to be a point in which we kind of cut it off because either it's not a fit for your organization or yeah. two, it's just the life cycle just way too long. Yeah, look, so I, I mean, there's a, there's one uh, particular experience I've had in this that really like, I think taught me this lesson really in a hard way. We were selling into uh, one of the biggest credit card providers in the world. Mm -hmm. And the whole time we knew that it was the wrong fit. That right. solution was going to have a lot of technical challenges uh, that we probably weren't the vendor that they actually should be working with. But the logo was so glorious, you know, that your ego gets in the way of that, right? It's hard, right. To, walk, it's hard to walk away from that, right? And I think ultimately, like we dragged it on for forever. We spent a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of opportunity costs, could have been working on much better things. Uh, and we didn't, we didn't get anywhere. But, you know, I, I think every salesperson sort of dreams about this, right? Like the yeah. fire the customer scenario, right? Because the, the customer is too difficult and, you know, um, but, but I actually think that this starts with sales and marketing leadership, right? And, and I think as organizations today, we have a responsibility to be very clear on who we're for and who we're not for. And there, there, I have a, a pointed reason about this is, is that like from the moment you wake up and you turn your phone on, you're being sold to, right? Yep. You, you, you're now decoding messages all day. So trying to figure out in this like sea of the same message, which one I actually care about is really hard. So when you think about being another marketing professional trying to get your message heard, how do I actually do that? One way you can do make leaps and bounds on that is saying we're not for this group of people, right? As soon as we've defined that we're not for these people and we are for these people, everything becomes easier. It becomes easier to build your value prop. Your product is tighter. Uh, you, you build features that are more meaningful, add more value that you'll sell for more. Your salespeople are more, more better equipped. Their pitches are stronger. They understand the problems better. So I think there's like a massive upside for organizations to focus and, and be clear about who they're for and who they're not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this speaks to sort of like um, in sales and marketing, we talk a lot about this term ICP. It's the okay. ideal customer profile. And so, you know, often these are things like what vertical, um, how many employees, what sort of like technographic attributes do they have? Right, right. What's their sales model like? And so these things can help you start to narrow that down. Um, but I think you're starting to see examples of people who are going like really to the forefront of this that are interesting. And um, there's a company called Clearbit who, uh, again, so we go back to content again, we'll give you a good example of this in full circle. Is so Clearbit sells data enrichment for SaaS companies. They help you basically not have to, you know, have people enter all of their information into forms. We can source data. We can, we can form fill automatically. We can leverage that data in, in new sales cycles and, and so on. Right. Um, and, you know, they've changed their ICP to basically only target people who will have the most value out of Clearbit. So they've changed their, their, their sort of baseline uh, criteria and they'll actually disqualify leads very early in the process to say, if you're not a customer who uh, over the X period of time is gonna have this type of lifetime value with, Clear, with Clearbit, then we don't want you in. And now to tie that in, right? What they've done is they know their target is SaaS companies. They wrote a really great blog post on like, here's all of the data science and here's the process that we went through internally to decide what this ICP actually should look like, how we evaluate a lifetime value of our leads and of our, of our customers. And here's why you should consider the same thing, right? So I'm not going to find that out from looking at their competitor. And that would be insightful for me as a sales leader to go, hmm, maybe there's something there, right? And those are the types of content efforts that like, as I show up to the Clearbit meeting, I already have a positive indication uh, that right. a company that it's probably, you know, up to something interesting. Right. And so uh, I also talk to those, a lot of sales guys in terms of just gaining knowledge around this. How important is, say, customer kind of upselling in an organization versus obviously a building a new relationship? Like, where do you kind of draw the line between what's more important um, as a leader um, now in an organization? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I think there's a really big shift in SaaS to, to really being able to focus on, on expansion dollars and customer lifetime value, net right. retention and being a, a really strong indicator versus like looking at churn or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I think like, I think it's hard to provide a simple answer to that. And it, we, I think a lot of it has to do with stage, right? Like, where are you in your growth, right? Like, if you're pre-series A, like there's no point in building a retention model because you have no customers, right? Yeah. But I think like learning sort of like looking at it from the growth phases, you know, there, there's a point where I think they start to become equal um, and, you know, you want to try to figure out how to, to drive those renewals and the upsell dollars at the most effective rate because it, it's the, the lowest cost revenue. Right. I have a uh, more of a personal question here and I don't mean to get you in trouble in any way. So uh, yeah, you can no. feel free to ignore the question, but yeah. um, so one of the things that you were talking about is understanding how you can help the customer, right. In a sales environment. So have you, how do you kind of manage or balance uh, the kind of need to, to sell and kind of hit quotas because as a salesperson, you do have that requirement in a lot of positions uh, versus when you run into those situations where you, uh, for example, the credit card company that you mentioned, where you're going along the process and you already realize that this isn't going to work out, but you like you don't want to let go of that sale, right? So how do you how do you balance that? Did you have a lot of instances in your early early stages of your sales career where you were like, I just need to push the sale or anything like that? Like how how do you find that kind of balance between the conscious side of it and the business side of it? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it, it, I think it's like it, I think it really speaks to. Um, like a fundamental shift that's happened in B2B sales, right? Like, I, I think also like there's like sort of this concept that like sales is a dirty word, you know? Like, I don't think a lot of people have like a really um, a great response when they hear the word salesperson. Like, I, like yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's the case. And, but what I do think has happened is that there has been um, largely due to the internet and like sort of, you know, to my past comments, a major shift in, in sort of the power the power dynamic between buyer and seller, right? Before, I, if I was the buyer, I knew almost, almost nothing, right? So I'd show up and like, you could sell me, you know, pie in the sky stuff and I'm taking your word for it. Hopefully you're charismatic, you seem trustworthy. Um, you know, it was more like this, like traditional sales mode, right? That pendulum has swung completely, right? So now we look at the world today, the buyer before he even shows up or he or she shows up has like likely already made a decision about your company, right? They come there fully armed. They've read something online about you. They, they saw you on LinkedIn. Uh, they read your G2 reports. You know, they've done a demo. They've watched a demo of your software. So um, the buyer now has much more power. And I think it's starting to put sellers in a world where they can no longer do those types of things. And again, because the other part here is that as also like our business model has changed, right? Before we're selling perpetual software licenses, right? So if you were like sort of like living on the bad side of the conscious equation, I could go land one big deal, multi-million dollar software license, set it and forget it. And like, sorry, you signed the contract. Right. Maybe we live in the SaaS world where like if you deploy something and it doesn't work, it doesn't function, it's not what it says it is you know that thing's going to churn quite quickly and they're going to find someone else who can serve them better. So uh, I, I think that world is sort of going away a little bit, I hope. I think that as a sales community, we have like a massive duty to try to like rewrite history on that, right? Uh, you know, and, and really look at sales as a service. And that's really what it is. Like the, the salespeople that do the best are the, are the people, in my opinion, who uh, like, theor- uh, like, both physically and sort of like as a as joke, wear their customers' t-shirts. Like I have a guy on my team who has a collection of hats from his customers in a past life. And wow. he's always wearing a customer hat. And to me, that's awesome. You know, like to the fact that you added enough value that they're like, hey, like, let me send you a hat. Yeah. You know? And so like if you if you wear the customer hat from the start, you, you, it will take you in the right direction. That's, that's a great breakdown. And I really like the pendulum example because it was a great segue into my next question here because... A lot of things or a lot of uh, the young uh, graduates who are coming out of school and, and kind of entering the workforce, yeah. they came from an environment where they're learning theory about sales and things like and business that were 30, 40 years or old. Yeah. And then they're entering an environment where we're in the middle of a huge shift. Right. Yeah. So what kind of advice would you give for these uh, these young graduates um, and, and, and the next generation who are coming into the sales world to be successful in that type of environment? Yeah, or, sure. uh, and and maybe if you can expand on 
um, what they should be doing uh, to hone those skills? For sure. So I think one of the hard parts, right? Like, well, there's a couple of things. So my overarching advice is like, if it smells like sales, run. And and, and like, I, I, I say this all truthfully, but like, there's a, there's an author and sales leader in Toronto. His name is David Premier. Great guy for you guys to talk to. Uh, but, you know, he he asks a question. A, is that the guy at the Cerebral? Yeah, Cerebral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, he asked the question sort of like, when was the last time you enjoyed talking to a salesperson? And it, that to me is like sort of a, it's a simple question, but it's like also a, a really like, it sort of shakes you in the boot as a salesperson. Right. Because the, the truth is n- never, right? Like if you think about being in the retail store and some a sales associate comes over to ask you if they can help, you like hide behind a rack of t-shirts and right. they, don't, they don't see you, right? So like, yep. you have to move away from this mentality. And I think the other thing that's really hard for new grads, and, and David Premier talks about this a lot, is that as you come into this role, uh, there's a couple of things that are true, but may I start, start with the first one, is that one, you're like brand new into a job you've never done before in an industry you know nothing about. And your target that you have to go try to figure out how to get to is an executive in an industry that has, in an executive who's been in that seat for probably a number of years or in that right. industry for 10, 20 years. So there's like a massive disparity between in, in experience, right? Right. And so often that young seller is like, especially like they get their first meeting with an executive and it's like, hey, we're, we're this company, we do ABC, blah, 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 blah. And it, it's painful, right? Like as an executive, it's hard enough to get 30 minutes on my, on my calendar. I didn't want to hear your pitch. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think if you, if you approach this from a way where like if you were meeting someone the first time and you were really interested in building a relationship with this person, you know, what would I, how would you treat it? Right. Like would I hard sell you everything that's great about me or would I sit and take some time to ask you questions? Would I learn more about what's going on in your life? What's motivating you? What's driving you? What's stressing you out? And, you know, and I think the more that you do that, the better you will rapidly understand who your customer is. So uh, the other part that I think is really hard for salespeople is like, there is no like education track to sales. You know, you don't, you don't go to university and go like, I'm going to be a salesperson and then like go right. on the, the sales track and come out with a degree, right? We sort of like go to business courses and then like, we think, oh, I'm an extrovert. I'll do, I'll do well at, at sales, right? And then you get punched in the face. So um, I, I think uh, it's really important to start to really evaluate is A, is sales right for you coming into this role? You know, what is, what's the expectation in that type of role? Because I think often that, that there's misalignment there. And then go and study modern sales, right? Like understand what sales processes look like. Do some basic training around like what, what are discovery questions, how to ask questions, um, you know, how to actively listen even. And, you know, I think that that will set people up for success. For sure. So you mentioned that you had a, a bit of a transition from being in sales and then uh, managing a team and then now fully managing a team. You had an in-between phase where you were doing a bit of both and now you're fully managing a team. So can you share outside of what you just mentioned right now um, in terms of, uh, you know, you just walk in and, and throw a pitch at someone bef- without even understanding them. Yeah. What are some of the common mistakes that you noticed, uh, whether that's some of the younger individuals that you were training or that you manage now? Yeah. Um, what are those things that you were noticing uh, that you were trying to fix from there early on? Yeah. So again, I think for, for us, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, we have you know, a group of really experienced salespeople who have mm-hmm. been in sales for a long time and, um, you know, are, are running, you know, really long, complex sales cycles into large organizations. I think at like a more basic level, when you start to look at like, what are the sort of like the first mistakes that happen? Right. I think there's, there's three that I think about. So the first one is like just talking too much. Right. Like the old adage of, you know, you, you have one mouth and two ears for a reason is really true in sales. Mm-hmm. Being able to like take that a step further, being able to listen to what is that person saying and what are they not saying? Right. right? Like those are, those are really critical. The second one is really understanding the buyer process, the buying process, pardon me, on your customer's end. And, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I've had conversations with reps where it's like, I just had an amazing call. Uh, they want it deployed by, you know, 30 days from now. And so, okay, that's awesome. Like, let's talk about that for a second. Like, what's their process like to, to issue a contract? I don't know. Who signs the contract? Oh, I don't know. Do we have to complete a security review? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure we didn't talk about that. All I know is they have $100,000 in 
uh, you know, they can they can sign it by this date, right? And so all of a sudden, a couple questions in, that 30 days unravels completely, right? right? So understanding like how your buy how the buying process works on the prospect end, really underserved. Um, and then I think the last one, and, and it's it's a dangerous one as you're new in sales, is like you sort of made a comment alluding to this, but it's just about over committing, right? Is like again, you're in like you're in a high pressure um, type environment having these conversations and you want to say yes to everything. The natural reaction as a junior salesperson is I want to please you, right? So like, I want to say yes to everything. And sometimes when that happens, you, you get way out over your skis and it creates a, a lot of challenges for an organization. For sure. I think people pleasing is, is never a good thing in any aspect of life. Uh, and I'm guilty of it because I have a hard time saying no to people. And it took me a long time to realize that. For sure. So- Josh, one question that comes out of that. So at what point do you feel like you should be telling your sales guys that you shouldn't be overselling certain features? I've I've come across so many kind of sales pitches, whether we, I think maybe this is more typical to the software industry um, of specific customizations available and stuff like that. At what point do you say, guys, like this is not possible. You shouldn't be doing it. Um, Again, to that idea of, you know, just getting the sale done. Yeah, so I think there's I think there's a couple of things there. So I think one, it starts with like what type of solution are you selling? There, there's lots of solutions that might be one part software, one part services, and there is like a large custom part. So like in that scenario, obviously you don't stray away from it. And then, and, and then in the other sort of more standard like SaaS scenario, I guess I think about it in two ways. Is one, you need strong alignment between product, sales, and marketing about what features are ready and when, and what does that go to market process look like? So that salespeople have a gate and you can't even talk about it until it crosses, you know, this point in time. Um, And then I think sometimes there are unique scenarios where we know that like, Hey, this is like less of a sale and more of a technology partnership where you're working on creating the future together. And in those scenarios, the only thing that matters is being extremely transparent with your customer about where you are today and where you hope to go and then filling the gap in between that. For sure. So I want to, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I do want to go back to something that you said. And you mentioned one of the best tools to use uh, when approaching sales is understanding what uh, the customer is saying and what they're not saying. So we always hear, you know, the most common example of of sales uh, conversation is uh, the sell me this pen situation. Ah. So, So can you use that example to kind of explain what you meant by what are they saying and what are they not saying? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right fit. Um, but, uh, I think like a, a more common, like what, what would be a good example of this is like, uh, it might be, it might be hard for me to tell you, but like, that's why, but the, the, like, if you, if you think about it, right. Like I might ask you a question, like at the end, uh, at the end of this, this thing and say like, do you, you know, so h- how was this podcast? Is, is this a podcast that you think is, you know, was good? And like your natural response is probably going to be like, yeah, it was great. You know, like, because you're not going to tell me to my face, like if you thought it was horrible, right? right. Often that happens in our pitches and our demos, great demo, great presentation. Yeah. We, we, you know, but what they didn't say is this is really going to impact our business right. or like, oh, I actually have a business case for this. Or like, so like, what are the things that like we we've heard, but also what did they not say? Right. And so sometimes there's, there's some stuff under there that you need to prod at. To understand like, okay, well, great. So does that mean that you would, yeah, you would consider using this in the future? You know, they, you can start to now sort of unpack that a little bit more. And that's, that's more of what I'm getting at than like the sell me the pen kind of idea. I think if more actively listening to your prospects to understand like, what were they saying? What were they trying to communicate? And what did they purposely sort of like hold back or not mention? For sure, for sure, for sure. So I want to kind of switch over from the sales side to your your company right now, Ada, uh, or where you're working right now, or Ada. Sorry, I think I mispronounced that. So, um, so about this company, so you guys uh, deal with chatbots. So I want to understand the benefits of chatbot, but can you tell us what kind of problems you see uh, that customers face that you guys are helping kind of resolve in this space? For sure. Okay. So first, like, I have a love hate relationship with the word chatbot. Okay. Um, I, I think like. Uh, it's very, in my opinion, very minimizing to what we actually do, but we use a, we use a chatbot to get there. And so, yeah, so in terms of like what, what's happening in the market, I think there's a lot of like very macro trends that are, that are sort of pushing things in this direction. But I, I think the first piece is like, we have to recognize that we are living in a moment 
where AI quite possibly could play a larger role in our day-to-day lives than the internet has, right? And we're, we're so adapt to like change, right? We barely even yeah. notice when that's happening. But the truth is, is that AI is really reinventing just about every vertical, uh, every industry, every product. Right. And so when we look inside of our lens, which is customer experience, we're in a very strange time, right? Our coffee shops, they, they know us better than our banks do. When I go to Starbucks mm-hmm. every morning, the, the barista there, her name's Lauren. She knows me by name. She greets me. She knows what I order. If I'm lucky, she like gives me a free cookie on the house or something. I feel great. Shout out Lauren. Yeah. I, I feel great about that. Right. I'm like, I'm so happy that I like, I went this morning. When I compare that to my bank, right. Who has decades of data on me. They struggle to not treat me like a number. It's only possible for them to treat me in a personalized manner. And the truth is that as we get bigger as organizations, as we start to scale our teams, our products, uh, our services, our ability to provide meaningful customer service and customer experience extreme, like, completely diminishes. It, it falls right off. Right. However, AI will completely flip that on its head. As we go forward, uh, our operating models, the fundamental operating model of a business will change from one that is human-based to one that's AI-based. And the companies that are really scaling today have already figured that out. And as we go forward in that way, we're going to move from a world where where large organizations today, who they stray away from customer communication, to a world where they crave customer communication. They're they're actually going to look at this now as every touch point that I can have with a customer is a data asset to help me build better products, understand my customer journey better, to reduce my sales funnel, to reduce my cost of support. So... This is like this is happening in real time, and it is an automation platform that can help ha- that, that can help make that happen. For sure, yeah. So obviously, this is the future and where we're headed. So, can you ex- describe to us what kind of tools that uh, Ada is using to solve these problems and how they can uh, kind of impact multiple areas of business with what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. I think there's really there's really three major things that we do. Is one is we drive massive efficiencies. So think about a world where Ada can potentially automate eighty percent of the customer inquiry tickets that are coming into an organization. Right, so a massive efficiency gain. The second is to drive larger uh, amounts of customer experience. How do you raise your CSAT? So if I can actually complete and go self-serve fully myself, be, right. uh, being allowed to integrate into backend data sources that as a customer I could never touch. Um, and then lastly is how do you automate revenue? So uh, you know once that sale has taken place and I come back for support, am I a valid you know customer for upsell? Back to Almond's comment about you know how valuable is upsell? It's right. in this scenario. It's it's very valuable. Right. Those would be the three buckets I would think about. Right. Um, and so, Josh, can you describe me maybe some companies that come to mind that do a really great job at making those efficiencies uh, happen, whether it's enabled with ADA or not? Well, that might be tough for that might be tough <laughs> for me to comment on. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. No, no worries. That's okay. Uh, so you touched on obviously the future of where we're headed with AI being. Uh, it, it's going to be woven into the fabric of business as everything that we know. Um, but at the same time, we talked earlier about you know too much of a of a good thing is is never a good thing. So at what point do you think automation reaches that point? Because obviously, a lot of companies and organizations are looking to automate a lot of their processes and. The goal is to always reduce inefficiencies, but at what point do you think over automation, is that a term or like what, what point does that start slowing down your progress? Well, I don't know if I would point to this so much in the automation lens only. I think I would like signal this more to digital transformation as a whole. Okay. And, and I think if you look at large scale enterprise and, um, you know, everyone has a digital transformation mandate and I would say the majority of those projects are failing. Right. And I think the banks are a really good example of this. Right. It's a huge organization, really, really regulated. And, um, you know, and they, they're living in a world right now where like every fintech is sort of poking them. Right. And yeah. folks don't really hurt, but everyone poking me actually does hurt. Yeah. And so it starts to create this environment where like millions of dollars are invested in AI in, you know, innovation project A, B and C. But those projects are really hard to get off the starting gate because there's not an ability to get internal consensus. That our data is stored in silos across the entire organization. I can't actually do what I want. So it, then it ends up in like an innovation lab somewhere in the bank. And um, you know, a friend of mine, Bianca, I mean, who you know as well, calls right. it innovation theater, right? Like 
how do you, are you just innovating for the sake of innovating or not? Right. And so right. I think often these projects start or there's an idea or there's a spirit and they're killed by inefficiencies in like sort of the political and consensus building and sort of red tape stuff that comes along with being a big company. And, you know, I think that's, that's where most of them fail. And, you know, you can point to McKinsey just released a lot of really good information on this and some, some interesting statistics about what it takes to have a successful, you know, a transformation project take place. And the number one thing, you know, not shockingly, in my opinion, is strong leadership from, from top-down motion. Being able to say that we're actually taking on this project for a reason and that this has sponsorship from, you know, the right level inside of the organization. For sure. That's fair. Um, so, you know, that, that, that kind of like cycles down, like all your sales stuff, we've grilled you on the, all, all, all the sales stuff. So, I mean, this has been really informative. As a guy who has not obviously worked in sales or Chairston, I have not, this has been definitely a good experience. But one thing I'd like to ask you, um, just like, let, let's walk outside of work for now. Um, like talk to me about one adventure or one story you've had that's haven't had, maybe you've already mentioned it, but has had an everlasting impact on your lifestyle and the way you approach your day to day. Okay, for sure. Um, so last year I ran my first triathlon mm -hmm. and, and in January of last year, I had never ran more than 5k. Um, I had never, uh, I had never swam for like fitness. I'd like knew how to swim, but I'd never like done swimming for, for racing or, or for fitness. I'd never ridden a bike with clip in pedals. Uh, and so I decided to take on this challenge. It was actually a, a, a teammate of mine challenged me to do it. And, uh, that process was really hard. And when I came time to actually to run the, the try, I happened to be backpacking in London. And the okay. long series of events, um, you know, I ended up, you know, having a change in my, my work life. And I took this opportunity to go and spend time traveling, which is something that I always wanted to do. But I didn't want to give up on the triathlon. So I, I, what I did was I figured out that there was actually a triathlon in London in a couple of weeks. I flew to London as my first starting point. Um, I figured out how to rent a wetsuit. I rented a bike. Um, I had all my stuff. I showed up to the triathlon with a garbage bag full of clothes and, uh, you know, I, I think everyone was looking at me like I was a little bit crazy, but when I ran the try, it was really easy. And what it showed me, what it taught me, and it, it, it has, um, had a very big impact on me is that if you take big problems and you break them down into little chunks and you focus on them daily, consistently over and over again, when the moment comes to like the big hard thing, it's not hard anymore. And, uh, you know, I walked out of that triathlon feeling like I probably could have started again and coming from a place in my mind where I was terrified of this idea and, yeah. I, you know, thought physically wouldn't be able. That's, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, uh, the one thing I can relate that to is like our, uh, obviously, you know, Josh, all the guys, but our trip at, in Peru and that hike that we did on, go yeah. on, God, man, just looking up that hill, I was just like, man. Just like we, we literally would just take slow steps and just go up like four by four. But that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I know that, that was an experience. Too. That's something I want to do really badly. Yeah, you should, man. I'm not sure if Machu Picchu is open anymore, but uh, or if, if this was the last year or something like that, but you should definitely go I, on that. That, that was an more years. See, yeah, that, it, it, that I, I know that that's like a bucket list thing that if they close it before I get to go, I'll regret. Yeah, no, it's so, it was such an amazing experience. Sherston, have you had anything like that? I was supposed to go and I could, I had to cancel the trip. And then the year after it, oh, that was last year's and then now it's COVID. So yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, Josh, this kind of wraps up the podcast portion, uh, well, the question portion. And so what we always like to do with all of our guests is a little quick lightning round. So, you know, just to get to know more about you. So yeah. Uh, just because this is Sherston's first time meeting you, I'm going to let him lead this and then uh, uh, we'll go from there. For sure. Yeah. So uh, you may have already answered our first question or maybe it's it, you have a different book here, but we always like to ask what your favorite book of all time is. Okay. Uh, good to great. Good to great. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of that one too. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question here. If you had one person that you can go to dinner with, your dream dinner guest, who would it be? Uh, Anthony Bourdain. I think like... Oh. There is no better dinner than a dinner full of travel stories. Hundred um, percent. Okay, so you obviously sales can be a little hectic. You have a long day. You come home. How do you unwind from a busy day? I think I do this in reverse. 
So um, I, I've made it a point to do something hard in the morning. Um, okay. When I spend most of my mornings pushing myself physically. Uh, and I've always sort of operated with this mindset that I have a small checklist of things that I want to get done in the morning. Mm-hmm. When I get those done in the morning. Work doesn't seem like a big deal anymore. Right. I actually feel like I've won the day before I sit down at my desk and it sort of in a weird way makes me feel semi-invincible. And at the end of the day, it's just the end of the day. Uh, so I, I think approaching it with a sort of a reverse mindset helps you create the, the right start. I like that. And I feel like you're living uh, what you explained of uh, kind of breaking down big problems into smaller steps and just having a schedule in the morning kind of makes the day go by easier. So totally. that's a great outlook. So can you tell us one company outside of Ada, obviously, uh, that you're most excited about? Yeah, and I, I say this not because it was the customer example, but uh, Zoom. And the, the reason I say that is I actually think Zoom's positioned to be the next Shopify in the sense that this is the next platform that people are going to jump to to start developing third party. Mm-hmm. Internally, yeah. Yeah, so if you look at what I've been thinking about this for some time and and. Uh, you, they just released something called Zaps, which is basically a framework and a set of open APIs that you can build on top of. You're seeing things like Slack, Salesforce, Gong all come into this UI now. And with digital communication being such a, a you know major point of how we go forward, I think this is the next platform where people are going to spend their time building that ecosystem of products. Awesome. Awesome. And lastly, this is kind of way out of left field, but we like to ask all of our guests, do you like pineapple on your pizza? Ooh. I might give you a cop out answer. Yeah, kind of. Like I would never order it myself, but if I showed up to your house and you had it, I would eat it. So, th- so you don't like it? You're just nice. No, I, <laughs> I, I like it enough to eat it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't go out of my way to order it. Fair, fair, okay. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. Yeah. I don't know if you want to count that as a win, Almond. Uh, but yeah, we'll... I'm, I'm gonna count that as a win. We have a run tally of this. Okay. What? What? So, the tally? I, I, well, we're like 20 episodes deep. I, I'm pretty sure it's like 12 and like 14 to six though. People love their pineapple. They love it. Okay. Yeah. Pineapple yeah. is my favorite fruit actually to be. Yeah. Yeah. As a fruit standalone, I love standalone it. Standalone fruit. And, amazing. Yeah. Grill it with some cinnamon on it. Yeah. Well, grilled is, grilled is top notch. Yeah. Yeah. But on pizza, it's a different story. <laughs> yeah. When you go to Nando's and get the grilled pineapple on the side, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, well, thank you so much. This was uh, this was really I, I enjoyed it a lot, and I'm not just saying this like uh, your example of the salesman. No, no, no I'm, I'm I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, cool guys. Thank you so much for having me. A lot of fun. Best of luck again. <laughs>